welcome to CC Gurukul lecture series on romantic literature. In my previous lectures, <clears throat> I had discussed the two literary giants, William Wordsworth and S. T. Coleridge, in this series. Today, I am here to discuss the youngest poet of this literary genre, who died at the age, very young age, yet leaving his mark forever with his immortal words. <coughs> I am here to discuss the great odes of John Keats. Before we move on to discuss his odes, I would like to give a brief introduction about what odes are. Unless and until we know what are the odes, we will not be able to appreciate his poetry. The odes are a classical form of poetry which are meant to be sung. <coughs> there are three types of odes, Pindaric Ode, Horatian Ode and Irregular ones. The Pindaric Ode is an ode which is sung in praise of gods. It comprises of three components, strophe, antistrophe and apode. To elaborate it further, I would explain strophe as the invocation of gods in whose praise an ode is devoted to. Antistrophe is the explication and an elaboration of a particular theme or reason for which the song is sung. Strophe is also called the supplication, thus ending with singing the praises of the God. They have a fixed stanza and a rhyme scheme to be adhered to. The Horatian Ode is a kind of ode that has been named after a Latin poet, Horace. He imitated Pindar but with far-reaching modifications. The Horatian Ode consists of a number of stanzas with more or less regular metrical structure but without any division into triads of the Pindaric, strophe, antistrophe or uh, it may be rhymed or unrhymed. This kind of ode is light and personal without the elaboration and complexity of the Pindaric ode. It was in the hands of Keats that the ode attained its highest possible perfect. This ode are the finest fruit of his maturity. They represent Keats at his best. <clears throat> All the characteristic qualities of his poetry find full and vivid expression in them. Keats was a deeply thoughtful and inspired poet. His odes are considered to be a kind of chain linked with each other and seem to tell the story of the imaginative development of John Keats. His odes narrate the story of his imaginative development just as the prelude does to William Wordsworth. Throughout all his great odes, a note of solemnity can be heard. We can actually hear the still sad music of humanity. This sadness deepens every now and then to make it his poignant suffering. The spirit of sadness is not the philosophy of Keats alone, but it was one of the most important traits of the romantic poetry. Keats odes deal with the favorite themes in his romanticism, the sculptural beauty and the grace of a Grecian urn, the charming myths of Hellas, the changing seasons, joys of the earth, the painful craving of the soul to find a beauty which endures the fascination of death and the bittersweet voluptuousness with which the poet meditates upon. <coughs> the outlines, the colours, the emotions and the melody in his odes, every single device contribute to the effect the poem produces. Each epithet that he uses is extraordinarily rich in suggestion. Each image opens up for our view of far-reaching perception. 
the rhythms are perfectly adapted to the supreme unity of impression a lot of critics have brought out the artistic beauty perfection of form and pictorial art that he achieves in his odes the ode to autumn is an instance of the beauty of nature ode on the grecian urn is the beauty of art ode on indolence and the ode on melancholy represent the beauty of emotion the Be- beauty of song appears to be the theme of the ode of nightingale all his odes appeal to the human senses be it spirit be it eyes ears skin so keats is also called one of the most sensuous poets of the romantic era each and every ode that he wrote has its own flavor we cannot generalize and sum up in a stanza to appreciate the beauty of his odes we need to analyze them individually in the first place let us take an instance on the ode on indolence it was written in 1819 it would be noteworthy to tell at this point that keats wrote five odes in one year that is in the year of 1819 he imagined himself in a mood of indolence three figures appear before him they are love ambition and poesy love is described as a fair maid ambition as pale of cheek and ever watchful with fatigued eyes and poesy as a maiden most unmeek the mood of indolence is successfully and effectively built up in the poem it contains an imaginative record of a passing mood it echoes phrases and images from the other odes but it reveals a very different attitude to reality here a state of nothingness is invoked as an escape from pain but this state has little in common with the ideal condition to which keats usually aspires the ideal world beyond flux is immune from decay but it retains the sensuous warmth the full flavor of actual experience in his own words the parallel is close but the poem takes us far beyond mere physical languor one morn before we were three figures were seen with bowed necks and joined hands side faced and one behind the other stepped serene in placid sandals and in white robes grazed they came again as when the urn once more is shifted round the first seen shades return and they were strange to me as may be tight with vases to one deep in fidian lore through a negation of human volitions he seeks to reach forward to a passionless and a desire less desireless state of existence although the disengagement achieved at the end conceals a secret despair three stages mark the poet's spiritual growth in the beginning he relaxes in serene contemplativeness and the idiom suggests an absorption in delightful languor the poet seems to have reached a state of non-attachment but his escape from experience is not yet in the nature of a spiritual conquest it is precisely at this moment that the three figures appear and reappear before him their dress gesture and movement show a deceptive purity and quietness but their purpose is to beguile the poet and distract him from his present mood immersed in reverie he does not recognize them but when they pass for the third time he feels a sudden agitation in his mind the poet seems to have reached a state of non-attachment but his escape from experience is not yet in the nature of a spiritual conquest the uh, the figures symbolize the life force 
the three manifestations of desire, love, ambition and poetry. The instinctive urges dwell in the poet's heart as their identities press upon him and he feels irrepressible longing to return to earth to the vital world of aspiration and action means that he is not cheated by the apparitions for a longer time he has to come back to reality the descent is momentary and the yearning for passion animated existence is attended with a sense of futility he realizes that ambition is a disease an ungracious and predatory impulse love is transient emotion like all other perishable objects see love he calls a perishable object the attitude to poetry is however hesitant and ambivalent the poetic order is felt to be the most consuming of all experiences the maiden is dim and most unmeek and yet renunciation proves difficult and agonizing the poet's mind is strengthened by knowledge that the apparitions do not hold any real threat this new gained triumph carries assurance of a genuine awakening into a different totally different plane of reality the liberated soul is compared to a lawn of flowers and shadows the imagery suggesting both freedom and seclusion the serene contempla- contemplativeness of the preceding passage is absent in the final stanza and the farewell is not free from asperity in rejecting love ambition and poetry he rejects life itself in one way and the ode thus occupies a singular position this is keats poetic corpus that you renounce one thing at the same time you accept the loving care with which natural scenes are described in the preceding stanza manifests a love of life and the green earth an attachment that is central in all keats poems so ye three ghosts edio ye cannot raise my head cool bedded in the flowery grass for i would not be deeded with praise a pet lamb in a sentimental farce farewell uh, yet i have visions for the night and for the day faint visions there is store vanish ye phantoms from my idle spirit into the clouds and never more return so he bids adieu to his dreams also vision sorry ode to psyche it was also written in 1819 and it begins with a short invocation and leads to the picture of cupid and psyche he transcends that psyche has never been worshipped and this regret gives place to a positive affirmation keats offers himself for the first time as the worshipper of psyche and he seems to regard psyche as the personification of beauty he promises to build a temple of psyche in his own mind and he would worship her with flowers of poetry and would never repeat his poetry o goddess hear these tuneless numbers rung by sweet enforcement and remembrance dear and pardon that thy secrets should be sung even into thine own soft conged ear surely i dreamt today or did i see the winged psyche with awakened eyes he can actually see the psyche with his naked eyes this is all in the mind in the in the imagination of keats the union of cupid and psyche symbolizes not only one level it 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 
symboli it has symbols at various levels at one level the union of mortal and immortal and at the other level the mind's attainment of its own identity through painful struggle keats in his priest like task worships this newly emerging deity that is psyche and in introducing the rituals he seeks to recapture from old religion and not its pristine innocence but its ardor knowledge that should serve as an antidote to modern skepticism his attitude to the post mythological age when the forest boughs were haunted by deities is ambivalent i wandered in a forest thoughtlessly and on the sudden fainting with surprise saw two fair creatures couched side by side they were in deepest grass beneath the whispering roof of leaves and trembled blossoms where there ran a brooklet scarce espied the poet's mind is likened to a forest and thoughts or meditations are objectified in the pine trees for murmuring in the wind in an untrodden region of this forest he would construct the temple of psyche the theme gradually unfolds itself in the last stanza the bar image with which the poem begins is reintroduced here and acquires a deeper significance it shows keats recognition that his own exploration is of an interior landscape and his ultimate devotion is not outside himself he creates a temple of psyche within his own heart and mind and he is able to express it in the words the phrase untrodden region points at an unexplored mystery of the mind's recesses and the statement that the branch thoughts are new grown with pleasant pain suggests both organic growth and the bitter sweets of the human experience the implication may also be that while the thoughts are fundamentally tra fundamentally tragic the mind transcends pain through understanding or by giving the pain an expressive form even he is pained in the heart he gives it a form and he expresses his pain through his words the dark clustered trees fledging the mountains show the upward ascent of the mind in its journey of self realization the word sanctuary suggests that the temple of consciousness is both sacred and unscrutable the bright torch symbolizes waking consciousness and the buds and bells and stars without a name represents the rich blossoms that only a liberated mind can produce with all the gardener fancy ever could fain who breeding flowers will never breed the same and there shall be for the all soft delight that shadowy thoughts can win a bright torch and a casement ope at night to let the warm love in ode to melancholy again is a poem written by keats and the central message of that poem is that true melancholy is to be found not in the sad and ugly things of life but in the beauty and pleasures of the world see how ironical it is that you find melancholy in beauty and pleasure and keats has been able to explain it in very beautiful words that this is actually true that the sweet experiences and the good times that we have in life they actually pass away they are just there to say goodbye they don't stay with you forever the world's true sadness dwells with beauty and joy the pain of suffering is less acute than the pain of knowing that beauty and joy will fade away soon true melancholy is always ready 
to uh, to you know say goodbye uh, to true, uh, true happiness is always ready to say goodbye true melancholy is to be felt in those experiences which are most happy he composed this poem in a row of five odes he illustrates the way in which deep sadness can be dealt it's the poem you know the ode to melancholy is like an advice to the ones who are not able to cope with their sadness and they turn to some kind of intoxication in life as a remedy to come up to come up out of their uh, sadness the poet tells the reader that beauty and melancholy they are closely related during the saddest moments one should be able to enjoy as an inseparable part of life sadness is an inseparable part of life but when the melancholy fit shall fall sudden from heaven like a weeping cloud that fosters the droop headed flowers all and hides the green hill in an april shroud he goes on to explain where one can find reasons to be melancholy she dwells with beauty beauty that must die in his own words he says melancholy dwells with beauty and beauty must die because beauty is temporary phase of life it does not stay forever you become old and your beauty disappears and joy whose hand is always ever at his lips bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh and joys are always there to say goodbye turning to poison while the bee mouth sips for him melancholy resides in beauty as beauty is not permanent it is transient and fades very fast she dwells with beauty beauty that must die and joy whose hand is ever at his lips bidding adieu and aching pleasure nigh all pleasures and happiness of life bid adieu in due course of time they don't stay with you only the memories stay with you and me- melancholy make and the memories make you sad melancholy lies with all the happy situations of life turning to poison while the bee mouth sips in the very temple of delight wailed melancholy has her sovereign shrine though seen of none save him whose trainless tongue can burst joys grape against his palate fine his soul shall taste the sadness of a might and be among her cloudy trophies hung this poem essentially deals with how to deal with sadness without any intoxication he tries to link his past experiences with present circumstances knitting them beautifully the beauty of the poem lies in his ability to show sadness in the kernel of most happy moments we move on to ode to autumn it was greatly you know keats was greatly struck by the beauty of season he keeps himself completely out of the picture and portrays only the beautiful season he describes various sights and sounds but does not express his own reaction towards them it is a perfect example of natural nature lyric he discusses only the beauty and bounty of nature autumn is called the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness close bosom friend of the maturing sun conspiring with him how to load and bless with fruit the vines that round the thatch eaves run to bend with apples the most cottage trees and fill all fruit with ripeness to the core the poem is the poet's way of showing his reverence and awe for the great changes that are brought by the autumn season in the form of the riches of nature this was the last poem in the series of jo- uh, keats great odes there are six uh, odes 
uh, which are very well known by written by John Keats. Uh, they are the Ode to Psyche, Ode to Melancholy, Ode to Nightingale, Ode to Aggression Urn, to Indolence and to Autumn. All these odes have received the highest praises from all the critics of John Keats. These odes are a unique phenomena in English literature. Nothing like them existed before and in them Keats may be said to have created a new class of lyric poetry. They are Keats' greatest claim to immortality. I shall discuss the rest of his odes in my next session. Uh, thank you.